Welcome to the Duke Basketball Corner Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Comerer. On this episode, in which I'm joined by Joe Gaudio, I decided to take the all-decade team format and expand it for Duke under Mike Krzyzewski. He coached most of the 80s and all of the 90s, 2000s, and 2010s, so we're going to make a 10-man roster with five starters and five bench players for each decade, as well as an overall kind of of best-of-the-best roster. Towards the end, I'll also update my uh, top 10 favorite Dukies list from when I recorded that episode back in 2015, so it's been a long time coming there. Just a lot of good stuff packed into this episode. I hope you enjoy, and I'm just going to jump right into the start of my conversation with Joe, describing how choosing all the teams, it definitely requires some tough decisions. You go into it, and you think there's a certain way. You think you're going to do it by best Duke players. Like, no matter what, these are the best guys. No, Or, or you could do it um, guys who kind of played the best team. Or you could do it guys who were the best college players. And before you know it, everything's all jumbled up, and you're doing everything. It's lumped together. And at least for me, that was probably the toughest part. How did you feel putting together some of these lists, Joe? And thanks for joining me, as always. Yeah, thanks, Adam. I appreciate it. Glad to be back. Um, It was difficult because what it made me realize is I've watched a lot of Duke basketball in my life. So a lot of players that I almost feel that I have maybe disrespected because they didn't make the list. But I, I did it more based on what the team would look like, what I want the team to look like. So I, I, you know, with the point guard and I tried to make it a predominantly a, a, a normal lineup that you would see out there. So, um, some, some guys made the, the starting lineup and some, you know, did not. So I, it just was, it was tough to, in a couple of decades, it was tough to, to narrow everybody down, but, but I, you know, I'm pretty confident with my list now. So yeah, I did try to get it generally by position as well. With, right. Yeah. With point guard, backcourt, wings, um, it front tough. court. It doesn't have to be exactly as mm-hmm. is, but I didn't want to just do it fi- best than best than best. One thing I, I try to do if if players were split between decades, I would do like whatever more years they played in a decade, like Leitner right. played like eighty nine, but three years in the nineties, so he's nineties. And if they're split evenly. Like Nolan, yep. like Nolan Smith, I would go with the more productive year. So Nolan Smith, although you could say he's 2000s, well, he split 2000s, 2010s. He had his obviously by far the most productive years in 2010 and 2011. So that's where right. I put Nolan Smith. So all these, it's going to be Duke players under Coach K. So when we start out with the 1980s, I am removing Gene Banks and Kenny Denard just because they played three years before K under Bill Foster. I mean, Gene Banks had one of the uh, greatest shots ever against UNC, sent it into OT in K's first year at Duke. But even so, with all res- with all due respect, I am just keeping it to guys who really played the majority of their career under K, if not all their career. I think everyone I have, that's all their career. Um, so even a guy like Vince Taylor put up some big numbers. There's two with K, two under uh, Foster, and also those are some not so much, uh, not so great Duke teams. Um, so he is not included either. The 1980s, both Joe and I, when we've spoken, this is unfortunately we do have some YouTube clips we could go by, but this is, will be the most stat-based. Um, in terms of how we chose, I'm not going to go over all the stats, but just in terms of, I mean, there's certain guys who we know, we, we, we've heard the stories, we've seen the highlights, we, we, we've heard him talked about, I mean, some like Johnny Dawkins, I mean, we, we know everything about that, but then there's some other guys, uh, kind of as we go down, who unfortunately, there might be some, uh, some guys who know more, some people who know more about those 80s teams. And I did email my, my old buddy, Ray Holloman, who I did a bunch of podcasts with, used to do Back in Ray's Day, and he gave me a rundown on some of his thoughts. And we actually ended up, at least for uh, him and I, with the same, the exact same first and second team with one difference on the second team. So it'll be interesting to see. All right, Joe, hmm. let, let's, let's have you start off at least for the backcourt. Let, let's have you start off um, – or you know what? Let's just go one by one. Uh, who who you got for your point guard? So for my point guard, I have down I have Tommy Amaker as my point guard. 
Absolutely, and, I agree. De- defense, defense, defense. I mean, it's not just what he contributed on uh, offense, which was – it was actually Johnny Dawkins as the point guard before Amaker came uh-huh. in. So he allowed Dawkins to move over to shooting guard. And, I mean, Coach K, that was that was the first guy he re- – that everyone says, K, that communication with your point guard is so vital. Amaker, you could see the trust was there. And uh, legendary, he's at Harvard now. I think Harvard's actually going to have a great year, but let's concentrate on the Duke career. Uh, Tommy Amaker, I absolutely agree. Yep. Who do you have? Uh, I don't think it's a spoiler alert who we have at the two guard, but I'll... Mike Buckmeyer. Oh, he wasn't oh. alive during the eighties. I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's my mistake. I didn't um, even know you were a Buckmeyer fan, to be honest. <laughs> I know it's a shocker. <laughs> All right, so I, I got uh, Miss, Mr. Johnny Dawkins, and as I don't do I. think that anyone who doesn't have Johnny Dawkins as the shooting guard for the eighties. That's I mean Johnny Dawkins. He. If you want to know the rise of Duke, I mean, there was the there's obviously the uh, recruiting class of I believe eighty three, eighty three, eighty two or eighty three. It ended in eighty six with the loss to Louisville in the championship. But that recruiting class, I mean, and we'll mention a bunch of those players that changed, and the leader of that group was Johnny Dawkins. All right, so and for, from here, I, I don't want to say definitively small forward or power forward, like. Who did you have in your third spot? Because with me, like I have another guard. I'm playing a, a small lineup there. Who who'd you have as your three? I had Danny Ferry as my three. Danny Ferry, interesting. He um, he actually I have as kind of a stretch four. So you you're yes, gonna have yeah. an ultra big lineup right there for your first team. For my, for my uh, for my three, it's another guard, Phil Henderson. I mean. If they – I would say he's kind of – I don't want to say the, the original J.J. Redick or Trajan Lang did, but, man, that guy could shoot the lights out. And, I mean, you go on YouTube, he had a dunk on uh, Alonzo Mourning, which was just ruthless. Phil Henderson, he could he could light up the scoreboard really, really like Phil Henderson. Um, so I, I already gave away my uh, my four, Danny Ferry, stretch four. He uh, – before, before 2016 – there was actually only seven players for Duke who had uh, averaged 20 or more. The first was uh, Vince Taylor. Then you got Johnny Dawkins. Danny Ferry, he he really lit it up. Um, and uh, so I have him as my number four. Uh, not I, my, my number four. My, my four is the power forward. Your four man, yeah. yeah. So my, my four man was Al Abdel Nabi. I had him at the four, 6'10". Played some, you know, played with the Blazers, played some NBA. Uh, you know, I, so far I liked it. You know, if, if this was my actual roster, I'd like it because I got some shooting around. I got, you know, some size and athleticism. And You're going big. 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 Which, I mean. Yeah, I, I got uh, I got Mark Allery as my as my five, as, as my center. Not the most mobile guy. And I will say my team, they could be a little risky on defense, but with Amaker and Dawkins up top, Phil Henderson played some good D. Uh, I would say uh, there's not going to be too many guys who will be able to even be able to get into the paint. Uh, who would you have as your five? I had Mark Allery as my five as well. Okay. So you're, you're, so, much, you're much bigger. And uh, I guess this was the – Prototypical big man, you know, just, you know, clean up the glass, play defense, you know, and – I think I had enough scoring around him to. I think you might have a bit of an advantage in the '80s if they played now. I think Phil Henderson being able to bring um, Danny Ferry out inside and out. I think that could be interesting. But hey, and Ferry could work on uh, Henderson um, in the paint. All right, so second team, or you could say bench. Um, my point guard starting off Quinn Snyder. As do I. Yep. Um, an interesting uh, stat. For Duke players, in terms of assist average, there's only let's see here. There's one, two, three, four, five. There's only six guys. No, I'm sorry, five guys who have averaged more six plus assists. And Tommy Amaker is one of them. 1986 with six, and we'll go into some of the others. I mean, you got Chris Duhon who did it twice. You got uh, Jay Williams who did it twice. Actually, Quinn Quinn Snyder. Wait. Hold on. Yeah, Tommy Amker, Chris Duhon, Jay Williams, uh, and Bobby Hurley. So, yeah, you only got five guys. 
It's 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 kind of crazy. How, how many? If you had to guess, how many averaged more than six point five assists for Duke in his in under K ever? One. You are correct, and we'll go into that a lot more. All right. So who do you have as your shooting guard on the second team or bench? So I have Henderson as my shooting guard off the bench. Which one? Phil. Okay. I, I have Dave Henderson, the other Henderson, who is the ultimate sixth man for Duke. Then I have, as a, I guess you could say, a small forward or another guard in a three-guard lineup, Billy King, one of the best perimeter defenders Duke's ever had. And, I mean, he is Mr. Defense. Wasn't much of an offensive player, but defense, he could really kind of glue, uh, shut guys down. Yep, I had the other Henderson. So I had both the brothers Hendersons, both the brothers on – Yep, on the same on the same line here. So, so I'm I'm going with a three guard off my bench, kind of prototypical to how Duke usually uh, runs runs their off their, their offense as well. So, scoring off the bench is for important. for my number four, I have a guy might be a little considered undersized, but Kay actually played him at center at, at times, even though he wasn't a uh, as as tall as your typical centers an athlete duke's first elite athlete i would say kind of i'll compare him maybe to a, a gerald henderson type of player robert bricky robert bricky there highlights galore of him and i mean what well, did couldn't shoot really but uh he he was great in everything else so i have him in there i have our uh i have our guy in there i i i, I felt bad once they put him down, I wasn't sure that he'd be, you know, the top ten best players in that decade. Mm-hmm. But an important one itself. I put Jay Bellis in there. Okay. So just another one that came along with that uh, recruiting class that kind of, you know, sprung Duke into relevance. You you may say, but uh, just didn't do anything great, but did everything pretty good. And you know, guys like that off the bench should have some, you know, uh, versatility in different positions. It's helpful to have. So, yeah, so, was, so that recruiting class, what was that? That was Dawkins, that was Allery, that was Dave Henderson, and that was Billis. Was there I a, believe so, was, yep. Yeah, nope, that was I a four. That I think those up. are the four that penned when they came in. So Okay, and for my, at, at my five center position, I have the guy that actually took Billis' starting spot, Al Abdul Nabi. So uh, big, big man in the in the paint right there. So I've got Amaker, Dawkins, Phil Henderson, Allery and Ferry, and then Quinn Snyder, Dave Henderson, Billy King, Robert Bricky, and Al Abdul Nabi. Why don't you go over your your uh, starters and bench? Yep. So my starters were I had I had uh, Tommy Amaker, Johnny Dawkins, Ala Abdul Nabi, Mark Allery, and Danny Ferry, and. Not in that quite that order. I had Ferry at the three, Abdel Nabi at the five. Um, and then for my bench, I had Quinn Snyder. I had um, Dave Henderson. I had Phil Henderson. I had Billis. And then I had um, I had Bricky in there as well. Yeah, I think my worry with your team would be how Allery and um, and Abdul Nabi would work together. But it's Coincide, good stuff. yeah. All right, so, so some of the guys, um, like I left Billis off. I mean, Billis. Great player, but even he would say he, was, he wasn't the most talented, but he, he, he tried hard. Um, and Kevin Strickland, I talked about him the last pod. We were like him, one of the few Duke players to uh, score over 30 in an NCAA tournament game. They have a guy named John Smith, who I feel like is some a generic Duke name who was just made up. <laughs> and if, if somebody is related or knows, or John Smith, if you're listening, I'm sorry, but I don't know who you are. Um <laughs> Martin Nestle, I just want to give him a shout out. Seven two, the tallest Duke player ever um, for a K. Uh, wasn't the most talented, but uh, seven two gave him some good minutes there. Is there anyone who you uh, struggled with, who you wanted to put in but couldn't find a way? So I put I uh, Strickland was my next man up. So he was he was there. He's kind of on the cusp of getting in. Talent wise, I'm sure he probably should be in that group of ten based on putting Billis and and others in there, but you know, he was the one and then I also left off Vince Taylor as well. So Okay, and uh, for those who remember Ray Holloman, uh, Mr. Duke Encyclopedia, yep. um, he had the exact same first and second team. The only difference that he had with me was instead of Robert Bricky, he did have Kevin Strickland. 
But besides that, he had the exact same one as me. All right, so now is where we start to get more interesting because there's guys that, I would say, certain age, we kind of grew up with some of them, watching some of them. They made us Duke fans. Others, they know the history. They've seen the documentaries. Yeah, let's let's get right into it. So, I think it's damn near impossible to disagree on the point guard. Are we, are we, are we going to agree on Bobby Hurley? We are 100% going to agree on Bobby Hurley, yes. All One right. of my all-time favorites. In terms of guys under K who have averaged more than 6.5 assists a game, we got... Bobby Hurley, 1991, 7.4. Bobby Hurley, 1992, 7.5. Bobby Hurley, 1990, 7.6. And Bobby Hurley, 1993, 8.2. That's wild. I mean, the only person more than 6.5 is Bobby Hurley in four different times. He, I mean, Leitner, in the documentaries, he's talked about how when Hurley came in, usually you have to earn your spot at Duke. It took him a a year, if not two, to really gain Kay's trust. But no, not with Hurley. Kay pretty much gave him the ball right away. And that's why I think Leitner started giving him a hard time in a a very nice, loving way, as Christian Leitner tends to do. But uh, it all seemed to work out in the end. So I don't think we have uh, any differences of opinion on our point guard. No, those guys won some games together, so. Just a couple. They had some success together, so. All right, so we got uh, shooting guard. Uh, I'm going to say my uh, Trajan Langdon. I, I Mine love as well. That guy. He, made yep. me, he made me a Duke fan. I mean, I was kind of – I've told the story before. It's not long. I'm um, just like my best friend at the time. We, we were little kids. I asked him, what's your favorite team? Michigan, Fab Five. Who's the rival? He said Duke. Duke was the rival at the time. And that kind of got me into him a little, but it wasn't until Trajan Langdon, who Kay refers to as the bridge, because when Kay was having back surgery, um, Trajan Langdon, I mean, Duke was struggling during that time, and Trajan Langdon was one of the main guys who kind of brought them back. He was the bridge to the successful Duke teams, very successful, of the later 90s. All right, who you got for small forward? Uh, so I got, I got Grant Hill as my small forward. Yeah, I think there's actually really – now that we've agreed on Langdon. So the only one I, f- I think there's only possibly going to be one because I think – yeah, I mean, Grant Hill, there's no doubt. I still will say the ni- the 93-94 season is the best individual Duke season ever in my opinion. And you can look at stats. I don't think they tell near the story of how much he carried that Duke team. I mean, there was there was some talent on the team. I mean, they had Antonio Lang, a young Cherokee Parks. I mean, that was Jeff Capel and Chris Collins, their best seasons. But at the same time, I mean, it was just it was a major drop off in talent. Grant Hill carried that team for four. Uh, I think we're going with Christian Leitner. Am I right? So I I stretched my lineup out a little bit. So okay. my four, I put Shane Badier in at my four. I like Badier. Badier had some some size, some length, could guard multiple positions. So I tried stretching. Ooh, okay. So this is where it's interesting. And Badier, he played two years in the '90s and two years in 2000s. Right, right. And I said if a player splits it evenly, I would have their two more successful years as the guy. So you're saying? Okay, then yeah, no. No, I, if you if you think his two more successful seasons were in the '90s, I am not telling you to take that off. I'm not trying to like rule over. No, no, I hear you. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I, he was more he was more of a focal point on those '98 and '99 rosters when you know 2000 2001 when we had you know the title runs and stuff like that. We had. Um, you know, we had Jay Will, we had Dunleavy, we had all those different pieces as well. So, I, from the minute he came on the campus, I became a huge Badier fan. So, I personally consider him in the 90s, but I can see him on the 2000s as well. I mean, because I did put a couple of those guys from that championship team on the 2000s. So. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say in 2000, 2001, his scoring majorly boosted up. I mean... He went 7.6 a game, 9.1, then 17.4 in 20 right. a game. So, I mean, you, you you could make a case there stat-wise, but he did have huge contributions on either one. So that's fine. If you want to keep Battier, obviously, I'm going to have him on my 2000s team. So I'm not missing him from the 90s as much as choosing a different decade. Okay. Right, so, so I do have Christian Leitner in my four, and as my, at my five, 
I have Elden Brand, a beast. He was basically like just an inside version of Zion Williamson. Big, bulky. You, I mean, he would just – nobody could guard him inside. He actually, in terms of win shares per 40 minutes, he has – I believe it's the all-time record at Duke. He contributed more to that team, the greatest – Duke team ever. I don't care if they won the championship or not. I know many will disagree, but that 1999 team was just, it was crazy. I mean, and Elton Brand was the focal point of that team. So Elton Brand is my five on the first team. Yep, Leitner would be mine. I don't think there's much to put in there outside of the fact that I still to this day think he's the greatest college player of all time, and I argue it with my friends all the time. I argue it with People just don't want to believe it, but you have a guy of that magnitude who who did what he did in a, in four years of college is just, I mean, it's unparalleled. And I don't think we're, you know, especially in the era we're in now, we're never going to see that again. Oh, definitely not. I mean, just to think, he hit two different shots in the Elite Eight games to send Duke into the Final Four. Mm-hmm. Every, everyone remembers the Kentucky game, but he did the same thing um, versus UConn uh, in. Um, Oh that yeah, was, yeah. That was 1990. Uh, wait, was that 89 or 9? That was that was in uh, that was 90. Yeah, yeah. So you, Kentucky was 92. So yeah, UConn was 90. Whereas an inbounds play, I believe there was about 2.6 left, and it was kind of a leaner from the elbow. I mean, two different shots to send the team into the Final Four as time expired. That's some Hollywood stuff. All right. So here, here is a decision which I think most Duke fans will hate me for. And I can see it, but at the same time, this is one where it's it's either going to be, is it a guy that kind of was best within the team, or is it somebody who I think was just better? I'm going with Will Avery as point guard, and yes, I know he did not slap the floor. I know he's not Wojo. I know everyone loves Wojo, and I love him too. I'm going Will Avery, and I, I fully understand why. People might hate me for it. I didn't go Avery. I didn't go Wojo either. Really? I went Collins. I went Collins at point guard. Really? I did. Interesting. I did. Okay. I just, I, I like the, he, he's a, again, he, I mean, I looked over a lot of uh, Wojo's, you know, Wojo, what Wojo brought to the table, so a lot of that stuff didn't make the stat book, you know, the stat sheet. So more of the hustle plays, diving for loose balls, you know, I, I, I had Collins there because I think if I really wanted, you know, I think I just think Collins overall was a better was a better player. Yeah, I, I think um, some might argue defense or Wojo was he actually defensive player of the year in '98? He might have been. That's one guy that I that I would not want guarding me at the Y at LA Fitness, any place I've ever played basketball in my life. I want nobody who plays defense like Wojo guarding me. Yeah, I mean, 96-97, ACC second team, 98, uh, third team, and he was the 1998 National Defensive Player of the Year. So I think that's with Collins. I mean, you're going with that shooting. With Wojo, you're going with the defense at the same time. I mean, I don't want to ever place one game in terms of defining someone's legacy, but he kind of who, – who is the Kentucky player who pretty who worked Wojo in 1998? Forget I forget his name, um, but Wojo really had trouble guarding him, and Kay didn't put Avery on him. As yeah, you much. were mentioning that last week. Yeah, there was a. Uh, All right, I'm I'm going to the Kentucky roster name. right now. It was um, Wayne Turner. Yeah, it was Wayne Turner, and Wayne Turner was kind of having his way with Wojo, and Duke gave up the big lead, and it's kind of the same thing on offense. Kay trusts the guys who kind of who he's rolled with. And on defense, does the same thing. But, again, one game doesn't define a career. All right. Not at all. For, I guess it really isn't, I mean, this is kind of, it's interesting because it's not really set positions as much because I already have someone who could be considered a a small forward, even though he really played everything. He he guarded centers at one time. Chris Carowell, my guy Chris Carowell. He was amazing. He was another defensive player of the year, I believe, in 2000. He did whatever Duke needed, and I just – he. I've, I've talked about how I'd love if he recruits the type of player players to Duke that he was. 
he was just it's an attitude with him really loved him yep yep i have carowell also at my two so my two three hybrid i mean like you said it's kind of positionless basketball these days anyway so mm-hmm. you know the majority have i have three guards and i have a forward i mean i have three guards and two centers essentially on my team so it's you know it's it's definitely positionless basketball for me i'll be interested to see who you have as uh, another center i think we have one of the same but uh yeah, because at my three, I have uh, Corey Maggette, who before Zion, you could possibly argue, is the most athletic Duke player of all time. And it's still wild. He only got, I believe it was like 11 minutes against UConn in the championship game. It's almost like Kay forgot about him. I mean, when he got starting time during the season, he was he was putting up over 20. And with Elton Brand um, on the first team, with the Clippers, they both averaged 20 on the Clippers. I mean, that was when... The Clippers, they were they were they were really going places until Elton Brand tore his Achilles, and that was it for that. Um, but uh, yeah, Maggette, he was a, he was a, he's a special kind of athlete. Yep, yeah. So, um, spoiler alert with mine is I don't have Maggette on my team. Interesting. I huh? I actually as my other guard I had Capel. I just loved the way. You, wish that you, gotta, you support those Duke teams during tough times. I, I got, I get, listen, I got, those are the gritty guys that stuck it out, played four years, you know, had some ups, had some downs. Uh, he's, he is, uh, he's the reason I ran around my house streaking that time he hit the running shot to send the U, the North Carolina game into overtime. Um, just the gritty guy. And I, I think a lot of it has to do with like what he's turned into now, just person wise. Mm-hmm. I think I think he's just the personality and the type of guy that I would want off my bench to come in and, and if I need a stop or if I need you know just a guy to bring energy and a guy to bring toughness and I think I think Capel brought both of those. Yeah, I mean what I'm doing again, everyone has their own way. Totally respect whatever you want to do. I'm trying to avoid anything. Maybe I we think can get about them together them. and play them. Maybe we can get them together and watch them play. And... Yeah, seriously. Um, yeah, I'm, <laughs> That'd be fun. I'm, I'm trying to avoid like thinking about what they turned into after Duke. I'm yeah. just trying to like the, the whatever it is, one year, two years, three years, or four years. I am just concentrating on that. So yeah, I totally agree. Capel, I um, he's everything you would uh, hope my, many would like to see him as Duke's next coach. I'm trying to avoid thinking him in those terms. I'm just sure. thinking of these guys during the four years. All right, so but he's my, a Dukey through and through. You oh, know, absolutely. whatever. So that's how, how do you, that's how do you feel about uh, Jason Capel choosing UNC? Did that, did that hit you? Hit you kind of hard. I mean, I'm sure his brother's going to take care of that, so we don't have to. Yeah, I'm sure they're they're not too happy about that, probably. But I mean, whatever. I mean, he's another one who deserves, you know, good opportunity, good mind in the game of basketball, and you know, good good players and good minds gravitate to good programs. All right, my number four, a uh, very a guy who, who I feel has gone under the radar in terms of kind of like Trajan Langdon, he was a bridge. Um, bringing Duke from the tough times to the elite again is Rashawn McLeod. Rashawn McLeod stretched for, did everything. He was he was a man in college. I mean, I swear he was like 30 years old when he was 19. I mean, he <laughs> really took control of that team when they needed leadership. Transfer from St. John's, um, one of you are they're definitely one of the top three transfers Duke's ever had, and. Uh, he was he was he was the first to really make a huge impact. Yeah, I have Rashawn McLeod as my four. Yep. Yeah, yeah I could I could see that. So I'll just lump my two bigs together. I had Cherokee Parks and I had Elton Brand as my bigs. So. Yeah. Right. So you because didn't, you didn't have Elton. Yeah, because you had Shane Batty on your first name. All right. So yeah, I have Cherokee Parks as my five. Cherokee Parks. He's a guy very good. I mean, NBA player. Mm-hmm. Um, I think some of the stats he put up, especially uh, was 90, 94, 95. Um, some of that had to do with the fact that there was really – somebody's got to score points. But even so, re- really good player. Um, so, yeah, all right. So for our 90s, I, I have Hurley, Langdon – Bobby Hurley, Trajan Langdon, Grant Hill, Christian Lader, and Elton Brand on my first team, and Will Avery, Chris Carwell, Corey Maggette, Rashawn McLeod, and Cherokee Parks on my second team. Yep, and I had I, on my first team for the '90s. I had Bobby Hurley, Trajan Langdon, Grant Hill, Shane Battier, and Christian Leitner. 
And then I had for my second team, I had I had Chris Collins, Jeff Capel, um, Elton Brand, Chris Carowell, and Cherokee Parks. Uh, so, is there any names you struggled with? You wanted to get them on the teams, but you couldn't Maggette. find space. Magetti, Magetti. I mean, he was the first guy to really like a, in the one and done era for the for Duke. So, you know, I at that time it was hard for me to consider him, you know, a long, one of the Duke because I was so used to the four year Duke players. So, um, you cannot. I mean, his his talent was unquestioned for sure. I mean, he was definitely a stud. I would say I struggled most with uh, Steve Wojo. Um, because again, it was him and Avery for that point guard spot. Wojo contributed a lot. I think he was the beneficiary of a lot of talent around him, but at the same time, he made a name for himself. Other guys, really like Antonio Lang, um, he kind of provided a lot of intangibles for Duke. Uh, Jeff Cable, Chris Collins, two guys you have. Um, you have spoken well about them. Brian Davis. He's the first guy I remember where it's like, I don't want to meet that dude in a dark alley. He <laughs> would fight anybody, and I love that. I love his attitude. And then Thomas Hill, who I think it goes a little yes. bit underrated. Um, he, he was a shooting guard, he, uh, one of the Hill boys. Um, besides that, a guy who could have been, I don't know, depending on his role. He didn't feel like his role would expand, I guess, which is why he transferred, but Billy McCaffrey. He was a huge contributor to Duke's first championship um, when they when they beat Kansas. And I don't know. I think he could have had a great career, but I guess he wanted to be the guy at Vanderbilt and more power to him. Some other guys like Ricky Price started out his career really well, kind of trended downward from there. But uh, you can see that after Cherokee Parks, Kay really had trouble recruiting bigs um, in the later half, of the at least in the, I would say, the middle part of the 90s. So there's some guys like Greg Newton, Chris Burgess, Eric Meek, who uh, were supposed to be, at least coming out of high school, better than they turned out, at least according to the guys who had watched them in high school. All right, off to the 2000s. Here's where um, I would say the audience gets a little more expanded in terms of we've seen, we've not just seen them, we really have memorized a lot of these plays. Who you got at the point? I have Jay Will at the point. Jay Will, absolutely. He, um, I mean, he's one of let, – let, let me see here. There's only been three Duke players under Coach K who have been named first-team All-American two different times. Can you name them? You said there's how many? Three players under okay. K who have been named first-team All-American two different times. Jay Will? Yep. JJ? Yep. Tell you, we've already named him. Leitner? Nope. Hurley? Nope. Johnny Dawkins? Wow. Okay. Yep. Jo- Johnny I- I was Dawkins. looking in the 90s, yeah. Wow. It's interesting. In terms of uh, Duke players who have been named to two different All-American teams, one first and one second, those are four others. Danny Ferry, Christian Leitner, Grant Hill, and Shane Battier. All right, so back up to the uh, 2000s. Who do you, uh, shooting guard, J.J. Redick. J.J. Redick, Not, there's no other. There, yeah, there's no need to even talk about it. J.J. is 100% my shooting guard you know, any he, place I ever go. He, he is he's in the heart of every Duke fan as their shooting guard, their personal shooting guard. Um, right. Lou Aldang, my small forward, Mr. Do Everything. He is mm. impact on that 2004 team was tremendous he could guard anyone at any position he could make every play off the dribble post three he did everything now my small forward was another guy who could do a lot of a lot of uh different stuff and guard different positions had a little handle to him my my small forward was uh was mike dunleavy mike dunleavy all right my four Here's where uh, you had him in the previous decade, Shane Battier. Shane Battier, two All-American teams, first and second in 2000 and 2001. Was he defensive? I think he was defensive player of the year also in one of those seasons. Yeah. I he's think he might have won it twice. I yeah, think, I mean, I he's just the wrong. ultimate winner. Jay, Jay Williams, uh, he was asked, if you could have, if you could roll with anyone um, if you uh, in the NCAA tournament, if you're entering now, who would you want most as your teammate? He he said Shane Batty, the ultimate winner. Yep, my uh, my power forward is a 
is um, also a fellow Chicago Bull, and that would be Carlos Boozer. I have Boozer at center. Um, and uh, Boozer, huge impact. Duke, Duke kind of rolled. They got by without him when he his foot was injured in 2001. But when he came back, that made him a powerhouse again. So Boozer, one of the all-time inside guys for Duke. And um, one of the guys that's helped shut up the critics who say, K okay, can't develop bigs because – Boos are definitely developed at Duke. All right, so second team or bench? Well, my center. Oh, I I'm sorry. Go I, ahead. Yeah, my, my center is Sheldon Williams. Sheldon Williams, good choice. The landlord. You know, just the landlord. You know, that pick-and-roll game they had was, you know, he was just, I don't know, it's frustrating because, you know, you look back at that team where they had Reddick and Williams, and it's just like, how, how did they not win? But. There have, been t- there have been two players under K to average 10-plus rebounds, Sheldon Williams and... Zion. Nope. Zion didn't average 10 rebounds? I don't think so. Hold on. Did I, am I crazy? Um, I mean, I think... No, he didn't. 8.9. Oh, wow. It seemed like he rebounded everything that hit the rim, so... Um... Right, think about it. Human pogo stick. Hmm. Mason? <laughs> Marvin Bagley. Oh, Really? Yep, Marvin Bagley, eleven point one. Yeah. yeah, he actually, I think he got, he got ten rebounds, like something like his first like ten games at Duke. It was wild, everything but like the Michigan State game when he left. But he was getting ten boards pretty much every time yeah. out, except for towards the end of the year when Kay kind of tried to save him because his health was a little gampy. Right. Um. So he had the team rebounded more, but early, I mean, first half of the season, Bagley was just racking him up. He had a couple thirty fifteens that were. Oh, it was like wild. easy, like they like you you know you look up and he's got you know he's got twenty six and thirteen with like twelve minutes to go. So okay, so on to the second. Who do you team got now. on that second team? Yeah, maybe we should go a little bit faster now. Let, let's go. It, you, if you have uh, more in terms of uh, the backcourt, like if you're going three guard, that's fine. But let's start out my backcourt. I have actually Chris Duhon and John Shire. I, I say like because. Shire played with Nolan Smith. They could both act as point guard. Duhon played with Jay Williams. He played yep. alongside. So it's kind of that two-point guard set, which uh, went really well. Shire did start out in um, the 2000, three years in the 2000s, obviously won the championship in 2010. But we talk about Bridges, like a Trajan Langdon, like a Rashawn McLeod. Shire was another one. He started Duke when they were struggling. He was involved. He was on the team with that uh, VCU loss. And by the end of his career, championship. So, uh, yeah, yep. Duhon and Shire. I have Duhon and Shire as well. All right, so then let's go three and the four. I have my my beast, one of, one of my all-timers, who I'll go more into later where we talk about favorites, but Dante Jones. And then I got uh, Mike Dunleavy, um, str- stretch four. Uh, D- Dunleavy, I think, I mean, he did play, I guess, more of a three with Batty at the four, but even so, um, he proved he could play with four at times, and Dante Jones with his physicality, man, the guy was a beast, brought something to Durham, which I think it's in the same, I'll, I'll talk about it with uh, some upcoming players, but yeah, Dante loved his physicality and his attitude to Duke, uh, another uh, transfer from Rutgers. Yeah, so my, my three was Luol Deng, mm-hmm. which you went into about, um, you know, how, how important he was to that team, and he carved out himself a really nice NBA career, too, as well. So, um, and uh, my stretch four I had was, was Kyle Singler. I was a big Singler fan. You know, everything he brought to the table, you talk, you don't look at a kid like that, a kid from Oregon that, you know, when he came in, I'm like, he was skinny, he was, you know, but, but the toughness he brought and, and, and just his, his ability to knock down big shots, and he kept stretching out his game and stretching out his ability to shoot and score so i mean he was a huge reason why we won in 2010 he might actually be the last player who k actually scheduled a game in their hometown where they're from to kind of reward him when he was a Mm -hmm. senior so i remember them going to play oregon which i i believe his brother ej was a freshman at that time and and now unfortunately but hey more power to the players but you don't know who's staying for four years so it's tough to reward guys Ahead of time. And for my five, I got uh, Sheldon Williams, who you had on the first team, the landlord, Mr. Blocks. Uh, he has two out of the three years that a Duke player has averaged over 10-plus rebounds, like I mentioned before. 
um, along with uh, Marvin Bagley. Yep, I have, and this might be a surprise, I mean, he's another one that I was a big fan of. I have Shavik Randolph. Couldn't stay my, healthy, but had the talent. He did, and he had some, you know, and that's the thing. He had some big years for us and had the ability, you know, he was one of the first bigs that, you know, that I can remember that could run the floor the way he used to run the floor and stuff. So, I mean, I I was a big uh, Shavik Randolph fan, so... Yeah, and I think one thing I noticed, again, similar to Battier, is um, you put uh, Kyle Singler in the uh, in the 2000s, whereas I have him in the 2010s. I have him being a little more productive in those years, mm-hmm. but you're, you're absolutely right. He did start off immediately ready to contribute, and uh, that was big. I remember he came in with Taylor King, who ended up having some mm. issues. And you went to Villanova. Yeah, and but but Singler is ready to take over the kind of the combined roles that would have been and just do it himself. So yeah, I mean Singler from the get go, one of K's most trusted guys. So I do have him in the next decade, but uh, I can see why you would put him in the uh, two thousand. So it's interesting how both Shane Battier and Kyle Singler we we differed on the decades, but hey, to each his own. Um, That's right. So in, in terms of guys that you wanted to put on, couldn't find a spot, any. Paulus. Hmm. I love Greg Paulus. I okay. love Greg Paulus. So <laughs> I, I, you know, another one that was undersized and the the brunt of everybody's jokes as a Duke fan. And, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, I just liked what Paulus brought to the table, you know, his ability to shoot to the left. You know, that's one thing I noticed is, you know, I play a lot of basketball and I am by no means a great basketball player, but I, you know, I've, I'm a good shooter. Like, that's what I've practiced my whole life just growing up, being a Langdon fan, being a Reddick fan. I mean, I would shoot and then shoot again. Like, that's all I wanted to ever do. And his ability to shoot to the left off of, like, a screen, off the dribble was phenomenal. But he could not shoot to the right. He just couldn't dribble. To the, I mean, so I think, like, teams just started noticing that was his shot. And, you know, he just... He just didn't – he lacked the elite athleticism as, as some of these other point guards that we've had. So, All right, some of the guys that I would would have loved to find a spot but couldn't. Um, t- again, more uh, bridge players. Gerald Henderson, one of the best athletes yep. ever at Duke. And uh, did, who, I thought who you had Duke? Gerald Henderson in your lineup. No? Your first team? Oh, did we not go over? Okay, then let's go over it again. All right, for, so for 2000s, uh, I have my first team, Jay Williams, J.J. Reddick, Luol Dang, Shane Batty, and Carlos Boozer. My second team is Chris Duhon, John Shire, Dante Jones, Mike Dunleavy, and Sheldon Williams. Oh, okay. Okay, maybe I thought that you had him at your three in your second team, so. Yep, so Joe, my- Gerald Henderson, I wish. Oh, um, did you go over um, your two teams? Yeah, so for my first team in the, in the 2000s, I had J, uh, Jason Williams, J.J. Reddick, Mike Dunleavy, Carlos Boozer, and Sheldon Williams. And then for my second team, I had Duhan and Shire in my backcourt. And then I had Singler, uh, Luol Deng, and Shavlik Randolph. Dante Jones is going to come find you and fight you. All right, and that's uh, one guy that I would be terrified that he did. So <laughs> I hope I hope he does that. If you're listening, Gerald, I apologize. Uh, no, Dante. Are, uh, Dante, I, I apologize. Gerald too. Both, yeah. You know, both those guys were were uh, huge contributors. I loved both those guys, but I just based on the roster that I was trying to put together, this I'm, I'm more of a stretch out shooting type of team and. Yep, that's totally fine. All right, uh, another Daniel Ewing, one of my favorites. Yeah, um, yeah. I think he went overlooked a lot um, by, by some during the time of Reddick and uh, Reddick and Williams because, I mean, there was a third scorer. There was always that third scorer, and that man's name was Daniel Ewing. Uh, yes, Lance sure. Thomas, more, much more than stats. He brought so much more than stats. He was a leader, and it's really tough to find that sometimes um, from a front court guy because they don't touch the ball as much. Usually your leaders come from the back court. Lance Thomas absolutely let, was one of the all-time leaders of Duke and was, was so influential in uh, their rise back up to the top. I will talk about him more with favorites. Nate James, as I mentioned 7,000 times um, throughout my podcast history, I went to his uh, – 
his basketball camp um, as a kid. He was my coach, made a half court shot, and he gave me a pair of shoes that I won, a pair of a pair of Nike. So that that's was a awesome. highlight. So maybe maybe there's a that's little awesome. bias there, but I love me some Nate James. Technically, you could say he's 1990s. I'm making an exception to him because he played two years in um, the 90s, two years in the 2000s, and then there was another year in the 90s where he got injured, so he redshirted. So I guess technically that would be 90s, three years, and then two in the 2000s, but I'm I'm not counting the redshirt. I'm splitting it, and then I'm putting him in the 2000s. And Sean Dockery. One, I was going to say, the, speaking of the half-court shot you were just talking about, you can't reference any of that without John Dockery. So. I mean, that Vatek shot will play in my mind until the end of time. I mean, it was it was wild. Nothing, no shot will ever compare to that shot, ever. They All won't. right, off to the 2000s. All right, it's, it's interesting. I think I'm going to have a different point guard than most. Let's start out with you. Who's, who, who, well, let's go backcourts. My my backcourt, you know, what, give me your backcourt. So I mean, and I may be playing um, my backcourt. You know, if I have to run a backcourt out there, my backcourt's going to be. I went I went a little larger at the two guards, so my backcourt would be Kyrie and Barrett. The two guys that can predominantly move the basketball and score. You talk about a scoring backcourt of having Kyrie and Barrett together. That's you know, and I use Bear as a guard more than a small forward because, as you mentioned in, in previous podcasts and stuff that we've done, previous episodes, that he was he was pretty much our point guard last year. So oh, yeah. I figured they're both interchangeable. Him and Kyrie could both either play with or off the ball. So, all right. So here's something which, again, anyone can do it however they want. I couldn't do it. I couldn't put Kyrie on. If you have not played one ACC game ever. I love Kyrie. I know. I could. I can't put him on here. At least, in my, and I wasn't going to to before when we were emailing talking about this. I wasn't going to put him on saying I'm do. I didn't want to influence. You can do whatever you want. Sure. Is, sure. Like, I, if he hasn't played one single ACC game, it's just. I, I mean, that's a good point. That is, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I just can't let myself. But I totally understand why anyone. Else yeah, would. if I'm going to war, I wouldn't mind having Kyrie on my oh, side. Oh, yeah. As, I mean, in terms the of just skill, so. there's no yeah. doubt. So, yeah, he's incredible. So there's a big gaping hole where Kyrie Irving, I understand where he would be, and that's <gasps> going to differ mine from others. All right, my backcourt is going to be Nolan Smith and Luke Kennard. Nolan Smith, uh, just, I mean, the mayor, the mayor of Duke, and yeah, he's- just what he did from almost transferring and following um, Johnny Dawkins after his sophomore season to Stanford to staying at Duke, taking a monumental jump from the sophomore to junior season and winning the championship, and then going from an explosive shooting guard to taking over point guard when Kyrie got injured and just leading that team. His stats were off the charts. And, I mean, just, and the leadership, it was just he was fantastic. And Luke Kennard. I thought to myself, I kind of just for fun went and looked at his highlights. Again, I don't think anyone for Duke has ever made it look as effortless as Luke Kennard on offense. Oh, yeah. Defense obviously was optional for him. But on offense, <laughs> I mean, there's a reason I called him Chris Mullen Jr. And he was just – it's it was so smooth, effortless. It, again, I just, I've just never seen anyone for Duke make it look as easy as Luke Kennard did. For sure. Yeah, so I got Nolan Smith and Luke Kennard. Um, my Who do you have uh, a small forward. I got uh, Mr. Jason Tatum. Over the course of one season, um, uh, there's not many who I've seen make as big as improvements as Tatum made throughout one season at Duke. He was great from the beginning, but in terms of playmaking for others, in terms of what I saw as his biggest weakness coming into the season, catch and shoot. She made huge improvements there, just improved on everything. And for one of the worst defensive teams of Duke we've we've seen in a while, he actually was not one of the problems. He 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 was pretty good on defense. There were some other problems. I'm looking at you, Luke Kennard. But um, Tatum, I think he got a lot of flack from Duke fans. I mean, there was there was some uh, beat reporter. There was a beat reporter who called him the most selfish player they had ever seen at Duke. I mean, it was just ridiculous, some of the stuff that was said about him. Just the improvements individually and collectively as a team, what his impact for that team, Tatum was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good one. I mean, Tatum is 
and, and he's another one. I remember his first when he came back and they were playing in the Garden against Florida, and just his ability. It was just effortless. His ability to score is just effortless, and you could tell that he had just playmaking ability from day one. And I, I, was, I was a huge Tatum fan. But my, for my small forward, who, who I like because he can guard anybody on that court, would be Justice Winslow. I was a, I, I figured another one that that you can you know depending on matchups can put him at the three, can put him at the four, he can guard a two. You know, sometimes he can even guard a, four, a five, depending on how big that five is. So, so I figured just his ability and how he changed our team when he moved to from the three to the four in 2015. I think that is not solely the reason they won the championship, but but a huge reason why they became a much better defensive team. That was you know, definitely a big point. reason. Yeah, I so, mean, as you, I mean, as you said, guarding one through five. And on the court, being able to post up, being able to mm-hmm. – I mean, in the NCAA tournament, he initiated a lot of Duke's offense. Mm-hmm. He could truly do everything. And – He wasn't a great shooter, but he could shoot just good enough. Mm-hmm. You know, he could knock down an open shot and, and that one head fake step to his left to the basket. I mean, he was as, he was as strong as physical as any guy out there. So Yeah, yeah no, I was, I was a big Winslow fan. He's one of the guys that even before the season started, I'm like, what? This, this guy, he's going – He's going to bring the physical. He's going to be another Dante Jones. Bring that physicality to Duke. All right, at, at four, I have a guy. I mean, geez, I'm just looking at my four and five. <laughs> I was. I mean, Zion Williamson and Marvin Bagley. That's fact, who I have. One hell of a back, a well. front uh, right there. Have fun rebounding with those guys down there. Yeah, I mean, I had. That's why I have my four and five as well. Yeah, and Bagley. Um, as great as he was on offense, defense can be an issue at times. So it's nice to have Zion Williams in there. Sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's, so I think that's well, scary, we both went over scary our four first five. Team. All right. Yep. So who did you have at point guard again? If for my starting to Matt Kyrie. Okay. Yeah. All right. The the guy I would say who some might have had if they didn't have Kyrie um, and the first team is Tyus Jones. I do have Tyus on my second team. Tyus would kind of – it's just he kind of meandered through games, and then at the end of the games, they would just <laughs> let him go off. And, hit, like, I would say, like, I actually found the stats, and I went and tracked his games. Like, 90% of his – not 9 oh, that's unfair. Like, 60% of his stats came in, like, the last 5 to 10 minutes of the games when they would just kind of say, all right, go get him, slugger. And he would just go off. It was wild. It kept happening. I mean – so many games, both the UNC games versus Virginia, to so many others. I mean, Wisconsin. Was, yeah, Wisconsin. Both Wisconsins. I, d- yeah. I mean, down the stretch, there, there's not been too many other clutch players like Tyus. And and to complete my backcourt, I do have R.J. Barrett, who will finally get to play off ball with Tyus Jones um, at running the point. So I think that's a heck of a backcourt right there. Yep, I had uh, I had Tyus in my backcourt, and for my other guard, I had Grayson Allen. Can't argue with that. Can't argue with that at all. Grayson, Just a he ton had, of scoring, yeah. He had some ups and downs, and that's still the 2016 season was, I mean, that was Grayson at his peak. I, mm-hmm. he, he didn't have major injuries, but he would just get dinged up here and there. And even by the end of his junior season, he just wasn't quite the kind of Explosive, wrecking ball he yeah. was. And by his You're senior right. season, not even close. I mean, that 2016 season, he was just flying everywhere. All right, so for my um, small forward and power forward, I got Brandon Ingram and Mr. Wendell Carter. Uh, Brandon Ingram, he, you could say he might play, he might be a better fit at the four, but I think he'll be just fine at three. You can kind of put him anywhere so long. I don't know if Duke's ever had a longer player than Brandon Ingram. Really can uh, get in those passing lanes. And Wendell Carter, he can he's just he'll do whatever you need and defense, that is his specialty at the four. And he can also kind of spread you out there. Yep. So at my three and four, I had Jason Tatum. Um, so he's a pretty decent guy to bring off your bench, I guess. I guess that kind of shows the riches that Duke's yeah. had over the last couple of years, bringing Tatum off the bench. Um, you know, just an electric score. And then for my uh my four, it's, it's one of my guys. And, you know, it's one of my guys that I'd play any day of the week with, and 
That's Emil Jefferson. So I just and he's everything he brought to the table, he was just a winner. And that's flat out what he was. He anything he could do. And his ability to finish at the rim was incredible. Like his ability just like left hand, right hand, he just he just had a knack for the ball and, and, and making big plays and just doing, you know, what he had to do to, to help others around him. And, you know, Emil is, Emil is a huge part of, uh, of that 2015 team as well. So, All right. So I cheated and I made – oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, didn't give my, I didn't give my five. All right. And I feel bad for Wendell Carter because Marvin Bagley, as much as I love him, he did have some issues with defense um, at Duke and Wendell Carter – he covered up for uh, some of that. Now he's going to have to do it again because I'm putting Jaleel Okafor at the five. That's so, my five. So, so, so Wendell <laughs> – sorry, man. <laughs> Jaws is going to be great on offense. But you're going to have to you're gonna have to save us again. So, yep, Wendell Carter. Sorry, bud. Yep, I – listen. I mean, another one that, you know, from that Wisconsin game on, the first Wisconsin game during the Big Ten ACC tournament or challenge there – you could just see that, I mean, he is just a grown man, you mm-hmm. know, and, and his ability to score, his ability, you know, defensively. That's why that's why I thought Emil was so important in that national title, because once we switched Emil on to Frank Kaminsky toward the end of that game, that game completely flipped upside down. I mean, they had no offensive, um, you know, no rhythm. And, and obviously Tyus and, and Grayson Allen were the reasons why, huge reasons as well, but. Yeah, I mean Jalil's not going to play much defense, but he's going to he's going to put some points up and he's going to grab some rebounds for you. So and he affects everything the opponent's doing. I think that's what people fail to realize. I mean, I don't know if you were online much during that season, but there was something called the uh, the Okafor theory, which was just the stupidest thing ever. Where there was an argument being made that Duke, Duke is better without Jalil Okafor. Or Duke would be better if they didn't play him as much. And I just re- I did a whole. Po- that was my first time lashing out um, on a podcast. I did an entire podcast just ripping that um, article or poster, or whatever. And I actually had uh, some analysts on there say like. What do you think of this? And I asked honestly without giving my opinion. They were just like, that's the stupidest thing. You have to look at what's going on around it. You can't just look – because all the Oak Fort Theory was based on is plus minus. That's it. And that that's the tough thing about stats when people just cherry pick stats based on what they want as confirmation bias. And it just – I don't want to spend too much time on that. I mean it was just – out of hand, stupid. All right, so now, now let me let me just say, oh well, okay, let's go over our first and second teams. Yep. I have Nolan Smith, Luke Kennard, Jason Tatum, Zion Williamson, and Marvin Bagley. Then I have Tyus Jones, R.J. Barrett, Brandon Ingram, Wendell Carter, and Jaleel Okafor. And for my uh, tens, uh, my 2010s team, I have uh, Kyrie Irving, R.J. Barrett. Justice Winslow, Zion Williamson, and Marvin Bagley the third, and then for my bench I have Tyus Jones, Grayson Allen, Jason Tatum, Emil Jefferson, and Jalil Okafor. Okay, I cheated, so I made a third team, and <laughs> if if you can kind of put it together, it's very unfair of me to do this because I didn't I tell can. you I can I was I do. all right so. My backcourt, I mean, because it's just the 2010s. I mean, that's where there's just more players. Obviously, there's more players because there's more one yeah. and dones. A lot so of got, turnover, yeah. Yeah, so much more turnover. So it was a lot harder because, and especially as Duke's getting not just good players, they're getting the top tier talent, mm-hmm. especially from 2015 onward. So I mean, especially a lot of turnover. So uh, give me your backcourt. So my backcourt would be Quinn Cook and Luke Kennard if I had a third team. All right, mine is Quinn Cook and uh, Grayson Allen. Because, I mean, it's just so tough to to think. Like, I did the first two teams, and one of the guys who I felt bad about was Grayson Allen. Because, I mean, he – if the rule had stayed where it had to be one and done, we could have looked at Grayson Allen as one of the last kind of backcourt guys who stayed for four years. And now that they're kind of letting that go in, I believe, 2022, we may see it um, revert back to staying longer for some guys. Who knows how that will work. But Grayson Allen, four-year guy. 
that was nice to see. And he has up, his ups and downs, but same deal as Quinn Cook. Uh, Quinn Cook, he he had the starting point guard job, lost the starting point guard job, had it, lost it, up and down. And I think it was a perfect um, relationship with him and Tyus in the backcourt as kind of splitting time between point and shooting guard. Yep. All right, for uh, three and four, I have Jabari Parker and Justice Winslow. Jabari, just he was he was a, a bulldozer on offense. Defense was kind of when he felt like it, but he, I mean that dude was unfair. He was forced to play the five too often, but even so, on if he was guarding anyone, it's kind of who knows when he's going to lock down. But on offense, he's beast. Winslow, you describe Winslow perfectly. Could play very versatile. Play one through five, and uh, yeah, had a huge impact on that 2015 team. Yep, yeah, he's a point forward. Knows, you know, in positionless basketball, like I've mentioned a couple times. I mean, Winslow mm-hmm. is is a great one to have. Uh, my three would have been Brandon Ingram, um, and for my power forward, my power forward would have been Wendell Carter Jr. So, all right, I just and- think that the size and in, in, in the inside out that Wendell brings to the table is. No, and he, he didn't get enough credit, you know, when he went out in that Kansas game, when he fouled out in that Kansas game where it was 100% the charge, and I still believe that to this moment. Um, I, you know, I, I think that game is, is easily ours if he's still in that game, just the way he was affecting the game. But unfortunately, it's, you know, it's a game of inches, and he was, you know, as important, if not more important than Bagley, I believe. So, um, and then my center would have been Mason Plumley. My center as well, Mason Plumley, in terms of, Guy, a guy who really improved every year through four years. I mean, they that 2013 team who got to the lead eight. They uh, they were really a team because there weren't. I think like Rashid Suleiman was really the only one who could take his opponents off the dribble. So it was working to get as good a shot as possible every possession, and a lot of it was based around Mason Plumlee. All right, guys that I wish I could have found a spot for, but was but was unable to. Some guys that you've already mentioned: Kyle Singler. Emil Jefferson, let's see here, uh, Rodney Hood, Ryan Kelly, uh, Frank Jackson, Seth Curry, Austin Rivers, I mean, some others, Trey Jones, Matt Jones, uh, yeah, as, we, as we go down, and then obviously Kyrie, but I just couldn't let myself. So those are some guys who missed the cut. Yep. Well, in, in an era where we've had so many good players, you know, someone or many someones are bound to, to unfortunately miss the cut, so. Before we go to uh, the all-time, or at least all-time under K list, if we were doing an all one and done, um, we ha- I, I, let's see here. I am going to actually pay, co- copy and paste this right now and send it to you. And I am going to go down my first team as I do that. So point guard, Tyus Jones. Shooting uh, shooting guard, I know he's technically, I guess you could say, a small forward, but I have uh, Jason Tatum for my small forward, Lou Aldang, my power forward, Marvin Bagley, and my center, I have Zion Williamson. So in just in terms of one and dones, that's who I have as my first team. I got Tyus Jones, Jason Tatum. Lou Aldang, Marvin Bagley, and Zion Williamson. So if you had to pick a first team, who would you uh, have there? So, I, and I know it's not going to be popular, you know, as never playing an ACC game, but I think at point guard I'm still going I Kyrie guess. Irving. You know, he's, he's. I mean, just his work is, I mean, his, his play in the NBA and stuff is just, I mean, you see he's that good. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I would. Mine would be Kyrie, Barrett, Tatum, Zion, Bagley, would be my five, my top five. Okay, and if I players made, that have, go ahead. If I, if I made a second team or a bench, I actually have a. Let's see. I'll start with the shooting. I'll go shooting guard through center. I have Barrett, Ingram, Carter, and Okafor, and then I actually put. I I, I can't decide if I want to put Kyrie, I, and in parentheses I put. Or Frank Jackson, if I can't let myself put Kyrie. I, I love Frank. I think Frank was not used the correct way at Duke. I think he had tons of potential to be a uh, a solid point guard at least. Um, I mean, obviously he was more of a combo 
But still, he, he had the potential to run Duke's offense as well as anyone that year instead of Grayson. So, you know, I, I'll put if I'm not if I'm not going to allow myself to put Kyrie for the regular one, I'll 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 go Frank Jackson. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I would have Tyus. You know, as I would have, I think I would have Ingram in there. I would have Jabari Parker in there. I would have Wendell Carter, and then I would have Jalil Okafor in there. I mean, I'm sorry, no, I missed, I missed Justice. I would have Justice in there over Wendell Carter. So it would be so, Bagley, Justice, Tyus, Ingram, and Jabari. Let's head to the all-time. First team, I mean, you got some all-time names here. Let's, uh... Let's go backcourt. I have Jay Will and Johnny Dawkins. Of all-time Duke players? Y- yep. I have JJ and Jay Will. You're putting JJ over Johnny Dawkins. I mean, you gotta stay true to my true to my word. JJ is is my ride or die. So that's that's my back guy. That's oh, my backcourt. He's, he's my all-time favorite, as as I yeah. will mention, but. At the same time, I mean, Johnny Dawkins, he did in the regular season, and he's he, what he did in the postseason as well. You're right, and that's I mean, the piece was, that unfortunately he's missing with J.J. Yeah, J.J. struggled in the NCAA tournament a little bit too much, but obviously we know how good he was in the regular season. Uh, small forward, power forward, I got Hill and Leitner. I have Hill and Badier, and I put Leitner at my, at my five. Okay, so I think, I think he's big enough. I think this is going to be the same thing as the '90s, where I have Leitner as the four, and I put Brand as the five, and okay. you you have Leitner as the five. Um, so I just have to get Leitner in that lineup. That's listen, he might play some power forward, he might play some center, but I had you know, if you're talking about the all-time Duke team, I mean Leitner, if he's not on your first team, I don't know, you're you're not doing it right. <laughs> So. Okay, and uh, so who'd you finish up with? For the the bench. No, for uh, who do you, who do you have the wait? You have Leitner at five. Who so I had Jason four? Williams. I had Jason Williams. I had JJ Redick. I had Grant Hill. I had Shane Badier, and I had Christian Leitner. Okay, all right. So yeah, I had Jay Williams, Johnny Dawkins, Grant Hill, Christian Leitner, and Eldon Brand. All right, backcourt on the bench or coming second team, Bobby Hurley and JJ Redick. So for my bench, I had Bobby Hurley. And who do you who else at your? Uh, and I had Trajan Langdon at, at the two. Okay. Right, Those so are my have, two. Hopefully, you have Dawkins coming up there. Otherwise, oh, damn. Um, all right, then I have Shane Battier and Danny Ferry as my three and four. Yep. So, so for my three and four, I have Dunleavy. And I mean, I'm sorry, not Don Levy. I have Dawkins. I don't know. I was looking at the other team here. Yeah, so I have Johnny Dawkins at the three, playing the three guard lineup with Hurley, Dawkins, and Langdon. And then my power forward, I have Zion. I mean, it, it it's just hard for me to put a lineup and a team out there of a guy who he's the best talent that has ever come through that those doors. So I I'm, can't disagree. I have Zion at my five. And then my five, I would put out in Brand. Zion and Brand, that is some pull in the <laughs> yes. front court, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. All right, so uh, second team, I got Hurley, Reddick, Battier, Ferry, and Zion. Who do you yep. have for your second for your uh, second team or bench? I had, I had Hurley, Langdon, Dawkins, Williamson, and Elton Brand. Let's finish up with our favorites, and this is something I did. Back in uh, 2015 when I made my 10 favorite Dukies list. And a lot's changed since then. What I might do is just do a new one every year. Because this is totally 100% biased. This is literally each of our favorites. So whatever reason you want to give is perfectly fine. Yeah, it pretty much comes down to personal preferences. Some people might be able to relate, some not. But this is kind of just fun to go over would you want to start from ten and go down, or just go from one to? Do you, how do you how do you want to do this? We can go ten to one. You can count back if you'd like. All right, give me your ten and your nine. My ten and my nine. So my tenth would be Kyle Singler. Okay. And and my nine 
would have been um, Bobby uh, Bobby Hurley. Can't argue with that. I just realized I have 11 because <laughs> – By default. I, yeah, I added I added Zion just because I was like I, he's just so remarkable that I don't know how I could have him off. And that right. makes – He's almost like in a category all of his all by himself. I'm gonna have to figure that one out. I will say my number ten and nine, Frank Jackson, and number nine, Luke Kennard, Frankie Buckets, the Mormon monster, what I, what I call him. I mean, he he never got to show near what I felt he was capable of. He was willing to do whatever Duke wanted. He actually he was the initial winner. Of Coach K, I don't know if he invented this award solely for him, but he won the Coach's Award in 2017. So obviously K loved him, willing to do whatever. Some might consider his season disappointing. I don't at all because whatever K asked, he did to the best of his abilities, and he could have been a lot more. He could have done a lot more. He had the capability. And uh, as I described, Luke Kennard just makes everything easy. It's that simple. Makes every makes everything look easy. Yeah, he did. I, I remember being in the stands for that Louisville game in the ACC tournament where no matter what he shot, it was going in. And everybody in the stadium knew it was, too. So um, so my eight would be Nolan Smith. Um, talk, like you said, the mayor, just instant offense, could play, you know, played great defense, knocked down huge shots, a great free throw shooter to close out games at the end of the game. So Nolan was... Nolan was definitely up there for me. And then also Shane Battier would have been my seventh. And for Shane Battier, I mean, just your typical 3 and D guy in the NBA, but also just a great mind and, and just a great general on the court, both offense and defense. And it's just it's a lost art in this day and age, a guy like Shane Battier. So, you know, it's good to see a guy that can affect the game on both ends of the floor equally. Yeah, there's no doubt who was the leader on that 2001 team. That was Shane Battier. My eight and seven, I got Daniel Ewing. Lo- loved what he brought. Oh, never felt like he got enough credit, and I still feel like that to this day. He was an incredible scorer, and I just think an incredible player. Played within the team, but I think if he played at a different school, he could have actually shown out a lot more. Um, and then. Nate James, who, if I didn't mention, even though I know I have, I went to his summer camp when I was a kid. I made a half-court shot in one shoes when he was my coach. I'm going to make sure to mention this every single episode and then pretend I didn't. So, Nate James, I have as uh, my number seven. Yep, I, I like that. So, do you want to do – do you want me to go six and five, or do you want me to just name number six, and then we can go five down to one each – like one each to one? Sure, you can go six. All right, so my – my sixth on the list would be Quinn Cook. Just everything about Quinn Cook, you know, came to Duke. He was, you know, a can't miss prospect, you know, a great scorer, was going to be this, you know, elaborate point guard. And he struggled. I mean, he had some struggles at Duke the first, you know, couple years actually until he found more of a jump shot and more consistency on the offensive end. He could score, but he wasn't more of a. He wasn't your your, your prototypical pass first point guard that that we've had in the past. So, but Quinn just the leader on that 2015 team, his ability to you know be the one veteran on that team to rally around the young players and just his ability to knock down key shots. He was, you know, he's just a, he's just a great player and a great Duke player. And you know, he he is and he's my sixth favorite player ever to play at Duke. My number six, Matt Jones. Matt Jones, I mean, another under-the-radar guy, did whatever Duke needed, locked down um, in that 2015 season, guarded the best wing anyone else had. He wasn't the fastest guy, wasn't didn't have the quickest feet, but just found a way to be the stopper, and he, he came in with a reputation as a knockdown shooter, the next J.J. Redick, which, I mean, from the first time, this is why sometimes recruiting is hard to take I don't want to say seriously because I know everyone who does recruiting, they work hard at their job. But, like, one shot from him, you could tell he wasn't going to be like that. But he was so vital. Two shots he hit against uh, – two threes he hit against Gonzaga in the lead Eight. To, um, I mean, they were as big as any. And, again, a guy who just did whatever the coaches asked, never got enough love, 
Got too much flack from Duke fans. It's not why I'm picking him. I'm just, he was just – he's a guy that – I love these under-the-radar guys that just find ways to contribute in every single way. I really – Matt Jones, he – Matt Ryan for the Falcons, screw him. Matt Jones for Duke, the real Matty Ice. <laughs> that corner three hit against Gonzaga, I remember it. And I remember Coach K's facial expression when that went in and said everything you needed to know. So – um, Wait, did I say so Matt Jones for, for the Falcons? Wow, that's Matt Ryan. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Okay, go ahead. E- either way, Matty Ice is Matty Ice, <laughs> yeah. right? I just wanted to clarify since uh, that sounded ridiculous. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so my fifth player of all time was Christian Leitner. I just, for all the reasons people hated him or the reasons why I liked him, <laughs> I think is I, I, he's just tough. He, you know, he didn't let any he had thick skin. Didn't let anybody get under his. You know, skin. I think that's why he was able to just continuously and continuously succeed and hit big shots. Because you know, there's some guys that the moment becomes too big for. Christian Leitner was clearly not that guy. Did you did you uh, call Aminu Timberlake beforehand and discuss? Do you do you, do you recognize the name Aminu Timberlake? <laughs> I don't know. He he is the guy who Leitner he stomped his chest against Kentucky. I I remember watching the. Uh, the, the, what was it the 30 for 30 of uh, I hate Christian Leitner and I remember watching that and seeing like they showed every single thing that would potentially make you hate Leitner yeah, and as I'm Coach watching Coach K after he was like that was just like a dick move <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah he's, there's no there's no game I mean they would interview him in his house he's actually he's actually from like 50 minutes from where I live he grew up out in the Buffalo area but yeah. um, he I don't know it, you know that's not a is he just? I just liked it. I don't know. He was controversy, but he also backed up everything he ever said. So, as that guy that was tougher than than many, many would say, you asked the Fab Five guys, they said the same thing. So yeah, I mean, that's Leitner, a tough guy. Leitner was obviously a more kind of out there about it, but I, I think when I was when I did the Greatner uh, Greatner uh, Grace and Allen podcast talking about his, his mm-hmm. issues, I mean, in terms of how Leitner and JJ Redick. They embraced kind of that villain role. I think that's what Grayson always struggled with. Leitner definitely, definitely did not. Created it. Yeah, he cre- Yeah. Yeah, he, he had no was, issues with that. All right, so um, that was your number five. Okay, my number five, yep. Ju- Justice Winslow. Justice Winslow, I didn't have in my um, in my in my uh, in, in my 2010s list, but in terms of just really appreciating everything he did. I again before that season I wrote a huge feature article bringing the physicality, bringing the nastiness back to Durham that hasn't that hasn't been there since uh, Dante Jones. I, I mean I just loved everything he brought to Duke. We've talked about him a bunch already. Justice Winslow, my number five. Yeah, no arguments there. No, definitely, definitely a huge Justice fan. So my fourth favorite player of all time will actually be Zion. Okay. Um, just everything about him, I enjoyed, you know, and um, you know, it was for, his time at Duke was very important, you know, very, very, you know, to as a Duke fan to see that kind of talent, to see that kind of kid that, you know. But I think, I think the thing that touched me the most about him, and I'm not gonna try to get all like sappy about it right now, but was when he was drafted, and he had a moment with his mother. Where, you know, you see how grounded that kid is about how, you know, it's more than just basketball to that kid. It's, you know, it's taking care of his family. It's his mother sacrificing for him to get to where he's gotten in his life. And, you know, just seeing somebody, you know, have all the talent in the world and knows he has all the talent in the world and stay as humble as he has. I mean, that speaks more to him, more to his character than his talent. But, I mean, his talent's undeniable. So I just figured that he's just one of my favorite players to just watch, and I just love listening to him talk. And I think he, you know, the sky's the limit for that kid because he's, you know, he's he's very humble, and he's, you know, he he's got a he knows where he wants to go, and he's he's done everything he can to get there. All right, I just uh, as you're talking, that was really well said. I've decided that. I'm never going to add someone to this list who literally just played at Duke. I'm always going to wait two years after just so I can get some perspectives. So Zion will Mm -hmm. not be on this year's list for me. He is eligible next year. 
in terms of uh, kind of the way you described him, I totally agree. And I think it's very interesting how when somebody's at Duke during that time, it's tough to really get much information from him, interview him. There's not much time spent in terms of for media trying to get stories. But once they leave Duke, then, hey, that player, it's up to them. Zion still wouldn't really – he wouldn't make himself available for stories because he never wants it to be about himself. And that's why one of the more interesting articles I've read was uh, Mina Kimes for ESPN. Mm-hmm. She wrote a huge article where she just interviewed people who were around Zion during the high school days and some of the teachers, some of the uh, kids who played with him, some of the parents. And it's just like there's nothing fake about this. And it's wild that, as you said, it's it's humble. And we use humble – way too recklessly these days, but Zion, he seems, he seems the real deal. So hopefully there's a lot of stuff that can happen once you turn pro. Hopefully he can keep some of that while still developing that personality. And uh, yeah, but best of luck to the kid. He really, he really seems like just almost too good to be real, but he is. All right. So that was, uh, that was your number four. My my number four. I mean, these guys have, (laughs) I mean, I've already talked about all these guys coming up plenty. Chris Carwell. Chris Carroll did everything for Duke. I mean, a lot of these guys, there's a trend of they do everything. It's more than just they're willing they're willing to play every position. They're willing to take whatever role needed and still succeed in any possible way. Chris Carroll guarded centers. Chris Carroll, he could be the scorer. Chris Carroll, he could, he could be the playmaker. He could just do whatever they, that K needed. He was just fantastic. Fantastic, and especially, I mean, during that, I, I will admit my bias towards, I would say that uh, the two, I would say maybe 2007 to 2006. That's the decade where I really paid most attention. That's not technically a decade, but those 10 years where it's just like those are the guys that will always stick out. That's when I kind of grew into my not just love for Duke, my kind of I don't want to say obsession, but like. I just really, really appreciate all the guys during that era. So Chris Carwell is my number four. Great. Yeah. Uh, Carwell's a good one. Um, so my third player on this list would be uh, Grant Hill. Grant Hill was um, – Grant Hill could have been, honestly, one of the greatest ever to get to the NBA also. You know, unfortunately, he had some ankle and foot issues. Um but he was just, you know, uber talented guy at Duke. And, you know, you hear him during the NCAA tournament, you hear him talk, you hear how he carries himself. And he's just, you know, he, he got a bad rap at Duke from, I don't know if you watched the 30 for 30, but, you know, many thought that, you know, he, he, he was not by any means, he didn't, he wasn't like a talker. He was just played the game, played the game hard, played the game well. Um, and unfortunately injuries got caught up with him, but his time at Duke, uh, he was just, you know, I, I, I find myself rooting more for Grant Hill and then playing my NBA 2K day or my NBA live days back in the day, I would always be the Pistons cause of Grant Hill. So, um, I'm just a huge, huge Grant Hill fan to this day still, and still, t- still try to like listen to him and talk and talk about him as much as possible because he was to me. And during that time, he was the best Duke player, I thought. But and those, that and might those, be and those Sprite a commercials where he'd play the piano. Those are some impressive stuff. <laughs> Talented um, guy. Yeah, and, and I'll say it again: that ninety three, ninety four season. Don't look up stats. Don't try to tell me what stats mean. Like that is the best individual Duke season I've ever seen. The stats will not show that. Watch some of those games. He he carried that team like I've never seen to the championship. And my arch nemesis, Scotty Thurman, with that rainbow jumper, I will never – Scotty Thurman, I will never forgive you for that If you, because I know Scotty Thurman is listening. All right, so we are on to number three. Wait, did you – wait, did you just – you just named Grant Hill. That was my three. Yep, your three's up now. Okay, number three. I mean, again, these are guys I've already gotten over. I mean, I've, I've probably mentioned him more than any other player at this point already, Dante Jones. Dante Jones – I will say most people remember him for the Virginia dunk. If you have never seen a dunk he had against Ball State, it was in the Maui Invitational. I'm still not sure how Ball State got to the final. Do you play them in the final? I don't know, like Ball State. It's like David Letterman's school. But, um, yeah, do you play <laughs> Ball State? And he just basically 
ended this guy's life. And he was called, it was called a charge. And I don't care. It like after, after the, after the dunk, coach K even reacted to, to it. Like, like how in the world could they go? I've never seen coach K react like that. It's one of the greatest dunks I've ever seen. Don, that, that's, that's Dante Jones. He will, Dante Jones is just, he's a good one. He's a good one. <laughs> he's a grown man. And, Oh, I remember, goodness. I remember, I just remember the shoulder shimmies when he would take a charge or just anything, anything he can do to, to be a spark to that team. He was, you know, I, I, I loved Devontae Jones. Um, so my number two player of all time was Trajan Langdon. Um, still hurts my heart to this day to see Khalid El Amin and those guys celebrate and not get the championship that year, but he, just pure, pure score, pure shooter, and um, you know he just was the first big time shooter guy that influenced the way I liked playing basketball and wanted to be a shooter in my front yard and stuff was because I always would yell Trajan Langdon and Alaskan Assassin and all different you know like he just I, I loved his game and you know I think you know he he's he's my second favorite Duke of all time. Hey, he might he might have been responsible for us getting Boozer, so who knows? Because Boozer is from Alaska too, and I guess yeah. Mario Mario Chalmers he's also from Alaska. He decided not to, but uh, Trajan got got us one recruit, and uh, I mean yeah, our, our number two and one is going to be the same thing. Trajan and JJ and Trajan. I mean I just I spent hours outside shooting, pretending I was Trajan Langdon as a kid, and he made me fall in love with Duke. He he was automatic. He unfortunately lost the ball in the last two possessions versus UConn, but he was the one who kept them in that game. He he was on fire as well as he was on fire for throughout his career. Better a playmaker than I think he got credit for at times. And it's just, I mean, kind of a pro's pro while in college went through kind of like a John Shire where went through the tough times and got to reap the rewards as a team. And then yep. J.J. Redick. J.J. Redick is J.J. Redick. There's only so much you can say about him. I mean, the legendary games with against Texas and all and all those. I mean, J.J., it was the J.J. show. And, I mean, the country, I've never – I mean, I would say the ESPN 3030 was made, I hate Christian Leitner. But that was during that time, people were just like, what is going on? And everyone was kind of waiting for that guy, that next – kind of white guy. J.J. Reddick got the brunt of Christian Leitner. So what Christian Leitner did, J.J. almost suffered for, and he didn't <laughs> mind it. He didn't mind it. He embraced it, and even now he'll say, like, he regrets some of that stuff, but he, it was never – he never did anything out of hand. And and uh, <laughs> being from Maryland, trust me, the Maryland fans really – they got into that one um, with uh, J.J. They said some inappropriate things to him. But, uh, yeah, J.J. JJ is kind of – he is a uh, – it's almost a category to himself. I, I agree. And, you know, I, I love how you dropped that Texas uh, game reference because that was actually my first game I ever saw of Duke was that game and got to see Reddick, Reddick's career high that day. So, um, and just, again, I mean, like you mentioned with Lang, uh, Trajan outside, I mean, I would spend many days pretending I was J.J. Reddick. I'd, ha- I'd go full uniformed to the YMCA and play basketball with a Reddick jersey and, you know, I, I can clearly tell you I was not J.J. Redick. Just if you were wondering, I was not not quite as good as J.J. was. But um, And then you just see the type of career he's carved out. You know, I mean, everybody who's ever played with him says he's the ultimate, like you mentioned, pro's pro. You know, and he became a great, great defender as well. You know, that was something that he may have got a knock on the first couple of years at Duke or whatever, but he turned into a really good defender. And, you know, I mean, just – just hoping one of these days he's able to, to to win, you know, win a title in the NBA. Maybe who knows? Maybe the Pelicans, the the new Blue Devils of the NBA, are are destined for that, you know, in the upcoming years. So, man, I'm just looking at. Do you remember JJ's most efficient game? No. Oof. I'm just looking at the box score right here. It was against Virginia. Um, what year is this? Was it home or away? Um, oh, here it is. Okay, it was January 29th, 2006, um, and it was at home. He scored 40 
I mean, it's just ridiculous to even look at that. How many field goal, how many field goal attempts do you think it took him? Thirteen. Okay, you're looking at the box score. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm oh not. wow. Okay, yeah, he's eleven yeah. of thirteen, eight of ten from three, eight of ten from three. Yeah, he, he actually missed a free throw. He's ten of eleven. And what's he mean, doing? That's, that's just disgusting. Yeah, Forty that's... points on eleven of thirteen, eight of ten from deep. I mean, this is like the most Duke thing ever, where Sheldon Williams has seventeen, and like nobody else did anything. <laughs> Nobody had to. Yeah, because uh, Daniel Ewing was gone at that point. So the number three scorer, Josh McRoberts, had nine. And then after that, Paulus had Lee, four. Paulus had four, Lee and Demarcus Malcaone Nelson had four. Team? He had Lee, Lee Malcaoni? He had three. Doc, Dockery, <laughs> Dockery had three. Yeah, everyone else had either two, three, or four. Marty Poches had two. Yeah, I mean, it would j- like, that's crazy. That's crazy. I mean, to, a, have, that, to almost have half, like, you don't see that anymore at big schools. He had 40 of Duke's 82 points. That's wild. Yeah. Have yourself a night, JJ. Have yourself a night. Okay, for guys that barely missed the cut, I'll say talking about kind of going through this and seeing how my mind works for this, and like I said, it could change year to year. I don't see the top of, of it changing too much for me over time, but other stuff, who knows? But kind of going through and seeing how I really like the toughness of some of these guys, I feel like I'm not quite sure how I've never had Brian Davis because, I mean, you got Justice Winslow, you got um, Dante Jones, Brian Davis. I mean, that dude would just – he was an intimidator. And, I don't, and I'm not saying he, he was like in a bad way. Um, he's just, man, you, you, don't mess, you don't mess with him. I mean, with him and later on the team, them being friends, best friends, uh, makes a lot of sense now because – <laughs> Oof. Uh, I mean, and, and then Hurley is a little pit bull himself. I mean, you can see that team where they were, they could be thought of as soft. Hey, they have some white guys. I mean, they had, they had guys who were just warriors in there. So it's not just talent. It's not just whatever the ranked as recruits. I mean, those guys, they came to win. So Brian Davis, I will always stick with my boy, David McClure. He is always my plus one. David, David McClure is, uh, I mean, you, you it, it's kind of like you. How you have soft spots for guys who may not have the biggest roles or put up the biggest stats, and they they were kind of on those transition teams where the team was struggling at that point. David McClure just did everything. His shot versus Clemson will forever uh, remain in my head. And then, and then the two others are my are my two walk ons, my two celebrated walk ons. Uh, first, Nick Paliuka, who I had my little. Yep. Tags for Player of the Year hashtag on Twitter going, and then somebody who I might not have mentioned ever, who, who somebody you might not know I'm a big fan, but Mike Buckmeyer. I have Mike, hmm. Mike Buckmeyer is my my other guy. So the guys the guys who barely missed the cut: David McClure, uh, Brian Davis, Mike Buckmeyer, and Nick Paliuka. Are there any guys who you struggled with at the last second? Yeah, I mean, and I I guess you do learn a lot. You know, you learn something new every pod. I did not know you were a Buckmeyer fan. That's uh, one thing I that I'm breaking news. I know. Well, hey, you know, hot take of the day. So uh, for me, I think the one that really was really hard for me to leave off the list was a meal. And um, I know if my wife made a list, it would be one person long. <laughs> and her favorite players of all time would be Emil Jefferson. Um, he just. Like we mentioned, you know, I mentioned before, he just did everything. He did everything. He was a jack of all trades, but a master of none. You know, he did. He became a decent free throw shooter at the end of his career, which which was not the case in the first couple of years. And you know, he was way better defensively. You know, as the years went on. And like I said, I mean, I, we don't win a championship if if he's not guarding Kaminsky. You know, because Kaminsky was having a was having a good title game and just. You know, he, he when he was hurt and he had the foot issues and just different. You know, he was a leader and he was there all the time and you, everybody loved playing with Emil. And as you see now, I mean, he's working hard and he's getting himself back into uh, into the NBA. So I think I think the one that I'd feel the the most guilty about leaving off this list would have been Emil Jefferson. I think Emil and Nolan Smith, those two were among that. They just looked like they were just happy to be playing all the time while still For competitive. Sure. I'm not saying they were just goofing off, but they just look like genuinely happy people, and that rubs off on teammates along with just the competitive nature. All right, so going back to, like, my list from 2015, just kind of seeing how it's changed, it was 
J, my number one, going from one to ten, J, JJ, Trajan, Kyrie, Dante, Antonio Lang, Chris Carwell, Daniel Ewing, Sean Dockery, Nate James, Rashawn McLeod, and my plus one, David McClure. So, JJ and Trajan, I don't ever see that changing. Kyrie, I think I was just still in love with, with like, the possibility of what he brought. And, again, it's just he didn't, he didn't play an ACC game. I can't do it. Uh, Dante says, stays. Antonio Lang, I don't know. I don't know quite. I really appreciate what he did. I feel like I was just doing that to be different, and that's just beyond stupid. And I really never do that anymore, but I, I'm not quite sure why, but that's nothing against him. Chris Carwell, Daniel Ewing, Sean Dockery, still really appreciate him. Nothing against Sean Dockery. Nate James, still have him on there. Rashawn McLeod's nothing against him. Still really appreciate what he's done. So the list, there are a couple different names that popped on there, but, I mean, I think it's just guys that – they're a little bit under the radar but still have a big role. And guys that just are willing to do everything and have physicality, I think those are the things that stand out to me. So, all right, let, let's finish up. Or is there anything you took away from the way you chose which maybe made you think about how you watch Duke or what types of players you like or anything that made you think? I, I feel like I picked my team like I was actually picking a team that I was coaching. You know, so like mm-hmm. I was picking, I was picking players that I could see. Oh, in this situation, I'd love to have this guy, and for this type of situation, I'd love to have this guy. I think these guys would mesh well together. So I didn't go 100% based on pure talent of the top 10. I went on what I believed would be the most cohesive unit of the 10, and 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 would give me the best chance of winning as a coach. I guess so. I guess that's kind of how I looked at it in light of, and I feel. You know, and there's no right or wrong way to do it. Like you mentioned, you know, some may just pick the pure top 10 guys they thought were the best in that era, and that's that. So I kind of went a different route, I think. Okay, quick voice question. We, we got brothers. There have been one, two, three, four, five, six brother com- brother combos. Actually, we won't, we won't make this a quiz. I'll go over it. You give me – if I say top three, I think that's going to be way too obvious. You know what? I will say uh, I'll give you three – and I'll see if you can get two of the other three. All right, the toughest ones, the Davidson boys, Patrick and Jordan Davidson, two walk-ons. Yeah. The Paliukas. Joe only played one, or I guess played, he walked on one season, while, whereas my guy Nick, he was for four. The Caldbacks, Justin and Ryan Caldback. And then there's three other brother combos. Can you name two? And these are these are combos that had more of a role. There's one which was... Big roll, hardly any roll. There's one big roll, big roll, and then there's another which I won't even mention. So are we talking they played on the same roster at the same time? No, just brothers. Really? Played for Duke. Okay, okay. So Tyus and, and Trey. There's one. Can you name one of the other two? At least one of the other two. The Plumleys. There you go. So can you let's let's see? I'll give you ten seconds. This is this is tough because this is the one that's big roll and walk on. Do I get a hint or I don't get a hint? Uh, like time time two thousand. The walk on graduated in two thousand fifteen. The big player played for Duke. 2010 to 2013. Ryan Kelly. Yes. And, Sean, and, do you, and do Sean you remember? Kelly. And Sean. Sean there Kelly. you go. Yeah. Yep. Yep, those are three. I might, I might be missing any, any others. If anyone. No, uh, I think, yeah. If I, forgot, I almost forgot about Sean Kelly because, I mean, I was a huge Ryan Kelly fan too. I loved Ryan Kelly's game. Talk about the, pro, you know, prototypical stretch four. All right. So we have gone over. 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010 All Duke teams, the all-time All Duke team. I mean, uh, we've done a lot for this pod, and uh, yeah, this 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 turned into quite a marathon. But I I had fun. I appreciate you doing it with me. This is some of the stuff where I think last season I really didn't do much in the off season. I can't remember if I recorded anything, but with uh, but with you, Joe, I I think it was fun just kind of going back and forth and and seeing how we look at uh, guys from different decades and 
how we judge certain players and just what stands out. So this was fun. No, I agree, and I appreciate it. And it's, you know, like you mentioned, it's good to, you know, we're both Duke fans. We've grown up Duke fans, but we have different views and and different, uh, you know, outlooks on how we would make a team and how we, you know, look at a team. And, you know, you mentioned you're more in-depth about when you watch a game to, you know, you want to be more analytical and you like that part of it. Me, I just – I'm – a ball of emotion for two hours and that's once that two hours is done i feel like you know the weight off my shoulders whether if duke wins it's a great night if duke doesn't win it's a bad night but you know i it's nice to go and and relive some of these guys and some of these moments that we've had in our past that that we don't talk about as much and you know it was an honor being on doing it and i think uh you know yeah it was a longer you know show or whatever but i think there's a lot of content in there and a lot of you know you you could see and, and, and hear from both of us how how Duke has has been important to us for many years. Absolutely. Well, this is fun. Um, we'll be back later with having decided some, some other sort of uh, Duke specialty pod, whether it be point guards, how they've been used, whether it be errors, different errors, and how Duke's changed over time, case coaching style. There's different things. They won't be quite marathons like this, but this was this was just fun because I think everything is coming out with the all decade team so i want to do not just an all decade for 2010s but just to go through let's let's not do just that and then others later let's just do them all so this is fun joe thanks for joining me duke fans go to itunes rate review if you enjoy i'm adam Comero. thanks so much for listening to the duke basketball corner podcast